Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the pride of Staten Island, legendary trainer Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. How are you and your family? We're doing good. Ready to kill each other after four months of quarantine, but uh, so far everyone's alive. Who's the referee? Uh, my wife, for sure. The only one who's Thank stable. Among, the only one who's stable amongst us all. I was telling her the other day. If you think of little kids as drunk adults, you have a perfect understanding of their brains. You know, they're just starting to develop, they're learning things. So when I talk to them and they do things where I'm like, what are you doing? I think, well, it's a drunk person. That's what a drunk person would do, right? They're just acting crazy. In other words, there's no timeouts in the right of family, just eight counts. <laughs> there has been no shortage of eight counts, and a couple of spankings have been passed out, I'm sorry to say, because I don't think they work, but they have been administered, unfortunately for we'll me. Keep that a, we'll keep that a secret. <laughs> we won't let anybody know about that. Yeah. You, you have a beautiful family, so... Oh, um, thanks. I'm thank glad. You, I'm you. glad everything's. I'm glad that's the worst of your problems. Yeah. No. I, listen. In the grand scheme of things, I and have I want no to problems. show my shirt. Okay. I want. I want love. I want love to everybody. I want to send love to all our fans. Boxing is life. Boxing is love. And um, even though it can be tough every once in a while, in the end, uh, there's nothing but respect. So I just want to say that love to everybody. Excellent message. And before we jump into today's episode, I just want to remind everyone who's listening listening that you have a new uh, boxing tutorial video on BJJ Fanatics. Um, you can buy this video. It's basically Teddy breaking down all the fundamentals of boxing from jabs to rights and lefts. It's, it's incredibly thorough, intuitive, informative. So for the people who've been asking over the past year or so that send messages and ask questions about the fundamentals of boxing, you can find everything you want there. I think it's, it's Teddy, is it $97 for the video? Yeah, that's, that's what yep. the... So please check it out at bjjfanatics.com. Search for Teddy Atlas. You'll see it there. Well, Teddy, let's get into it. There's a lot of stuff to discuss in boxing and in MMA. But before we jump into a quick note, um, your fighter, Alex Vosdick, announced his retirement last week. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Um, I just want him to be happy. So, you know, he's an honest kid. He fights an honest fight, and he lives an honest life. And... Um, but you see is what you get. Nothing short, nothing less, I would expect. And he didn't want to, you know, if you don't have to fire to do this anymore, you shouldn't do it. Um, because you cheat yourself, you cheat the people with you. Um, you know, you, you don't want to be in a situation where one day you're in a corner and I'm looking into your eyes and there's nothing there, you know, and you always have to be, it's one thing to be smart and to be physically gifted and to know the techniques and to be in shape, but it's another to know why you're there. And if you get to the point where you know why you shouldn't be there, then you need to be able to ascertain that, to be able to understand that just as well. And he's an honest enough kid where he did. Where, you know, we thought I wanted him to have six months off after that very tough better be a fight. He fought a great fight. We were winning going into the tenth round, but against a special, special guy, the best light heavyweight in the world, and a very, very relentless guy that checks all the boxes, you know, physically and mentally. Not only can he punch and he's great, you know, endurance and great relentlessness and he's TV friendly, but he's mentally at that place we talk about, you know, where um, you're not, you know, you're not just, you're not just going to beat him only technically, you have to beat him in all dimensions and you have to do it all night long because even if you have the edge on him, he's going to find a way. He's going to find a way to go to that next place, that next gear to not give up what he worked so hard to give up. And it was a real battle between him and Alex. 
you know, in those areas. And it was a tough fight. So we wanted time off. So I want him to have six months off. And then top rank, his promoter was going to bring him back and his manager. And you know, they asked, how long do you want? Six months. So it's that kind of fight. He needs that kind of time to look out for the fighter the right way, to be responsible for him. And um, that was that would have brought us to about April. So we were ready to come back. And then, you know, they were talked about offering us a fight, but then it didn't happen. Then another fight didn't happen. You know, those things happen. I think if the fight happened when it was supposed to, one of those fights, he'd probably still be fighting. But it didn't. It didn't. And normally that would just be another thing to overcome, the disappointment of not getting that fight. It would just be another thing you overcome in life. You know, it's all dimensions of overcoming and um, but and we even had a mini camp because I didn't want to wait, you know, with the virus coming and everything else. Well, actually, we did the mini camp just before the virus, but with not knowing when he was going to be back in the ring, with like I said, with a couple of dates being offered, and for whatever reason, they they didn't happen. I wanted we were supposed to then be ready to fight probably in June. And then, of course, the, uh, anyway, as things happened, the virus came. But before we knew that, I said, let's get ready. So we brought him to New York, to my place, to my house, and had a two-week mini camp. And he looked good. I mean, I really pushed him, Ken. I pushed him because I wanted to see if he was okay. I wanted him to see if he was okay. I want him to know, do you still ready to do this at this level? We do it at a high level. You know, we do it at a high level. Are you ready to do this? And everything looked like a yes. You know, it's kind of like uh, if you had your car fixed and, you know, it seems like it's good, but now you're taking it on a highway. And you want to see is that the mechanics really fix that thing, you know? And I took them on the highway. I took him on the highway, and I'm telling you, we were running hills. We were doing. I even had him spar within that two week time period. Normally, I would have gave him two full weeks before he started sparring after six months off, but I, I didn't. Gave him about a week and a half, then we sparred for the next half a week, and he he looked good, and pushed him, pushed him mentally, physically, corrected the things we had to correct, worked on the things we. We had to work hard to move forward um, for what we were looking at. Looked at the tape of the Better Be A Fight for the first time the two of us had not seen it yet. And we watched it together. Mm -hmm. And we saw what we needed to see, that he went into a dark place. And the next time we would go in there, we would have a light. We would have a light to know where we were going more. And we were ready to go. But... As time went on and, you know, the boxes started to come back, uh, we, we didn't really get offered uh, really a, just a conclusive situation, a real solid understanding of a fight. And again, no excuses. There's no excuses in this business. No excuses in life either. You either have reasons why you're doing something or excuses why you're not. We don't want to be one of those. And uh, at the end, he has an opportunity to do something else. And being the kid that he is, just like being the champion he was, he faced up to it. He faced up to it and told me that, you know, I'm not, I'm not at the place I need to be uh, in the ways we speak, in the ways we talk, in the ways that we agree to be and understand we must be and made the decision to uh you know to re to retire which was the right decision because of that how many guys don't consider they were world champion how many guys could say they did at the time the best puncher in the business other than wilder um stevenson adonis stevenson what a tremendous champion he was he held the title for five and a half years he was the longest reigning champion. And, you know, he was, I know that he was getting older. 
I, I know I know everything. I get it. I, I'm not saying I'm smart. I'm just saying I, I know what's out there. And um but he was he was even at his age, Stevenson was still the best light heavyweight at that time. He was still fighting well. And that night he fought real well, real well. And Alex had to have a really, really disciplined plan, strategy plan. And he had to execute it under pressure up in Canada with a southpaw and with a guy who, if he wasn't the hardest puncher, he was the second hardest puncher in boxing. And he had a better delivery system than Wilder. He was a better boxer than Wilder. So he could get the punch off in a, in a more sophisticated way. And yeah, there was no margin favor that night. None. None. And he made a transition in an eight-week training camp. He made a transition that I thought he needed to make to fight that fight. You know, to fight that perfect fight, if you will, where you where you give angles, you don't you don't let the guy line you up, you don't throw anything from the wrong place. One thing thrown from the wrong place, bang. Tenth round, sure enough, we threw one thing from the wrong place, bang. He got caught that left hand, he got hurt, he survived it, and he knocked out Stevenson in the eleventh round. Um, he had a tremendous night. He won the world title. He was a bronze medalist in the Olympics. Uh, he's a kid that I respect, I care about, and I'm just glad that he's healthy and he's got a beautiful family and he's doing what he wants to do. Yeah. I wish him nothing but luck. And a lot of people don't realize it, but he's got a uh, college degree. I think he might even have a law degree in the Ukraine and uh, he's going to move on to the next phase of his career in the professional world. So... Best of luck to Alex. Couldn't be a nicer guy. Um, next topic in boxing I want to touch on with you is uh, Big Baby Miller. Third time convict caught with PEDs. I mean, the fact Let me that tell you one thing. Let me, but you, I'm going to leave it to you. Yeah. I'm going to say one thing. If, you, if we get a power shortage suddenly, and I hope we don't, but if we get a power shortage suddenly and it only affects the lights, Everything goes dark. Bring baby Miller over and he'll light the room up. He'll light the room up. I mean, how? when is enough enough? Dude, you, I think you're clearly dealing with some psychological issues. He's clearly scared of something. He's scared of competing clean. You wouldn't do that if, if, if you got released from prison uh, to a halfway house because you were you know, in prison for being a drug addict. And they tell you, we're going to test you every day in the sober house. Yeah, okay, no problem. I'm happy to be back. Thanks, man. Next day, boom, heroin. Caught. It's the same exact thing. Dude, you've been caught twice. Somehow, in the sport of boxing, you get another heroin, chance. Heroin, heroin with possession of a gun. <laughs> so you're using that analogy. Yes. I mean, when does his... Let me ask something. We're all knocking him. And he deserves it. He deserves it. But... What about his people? Don't they deserve some knocking? Don't they deserve some, take some culpability here? They make money with them. They're responsible for them. You know, listen, nobody knows better than me that a man's responsible for being a man himself. Bang. But this is a team business, you know, and he's got managers and trainers and, you know, promoters. Those people that are around them, pretty much 24 seven when he's training the trainers the, the rest of them, they have to hold some responsibility here. Some, I'm not, I get it. It's him. I say it again. It's him. But why are you around them? If you can't offer something to make sure he's not doing the wrong thing, what are you around? Why are you a parent? If you're letting your kid eat every ice cream cone in existence on the planet, <laughs> and your kid's a little overweight, okay? <laughs> I, 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 you know, yeah, I hate to see kids overweight, but he's a little overweight. You, you would think that the team around him would say, listen, Jarrell, considering your past convictions, I don't want to go down with the ship here. If you're still doing that, I can't be around you. And if you get caught again, I'm, gonna t I'm telling you right now, I, I don't want any part of this. So 
you, you know, to your point, now he goes down again. Let like me ask you a question. To that point, let me ask you a question. You, should, we know we don't have proper policing in this business, but okay, they caught him, we'll see what the, we'll see what the, uh, we'll see what the penalty is. Okay, now, it should be fairly stern. You know, he's caught again. All right, but don't you think along the lines of what I'm speaking of, that his people should be penalized in some way along with him. In other words, his license is going to be suspended, we would think, right? So shouldn't they, haven't they shown a lack of ability to be responsible in this business, to make sure that people under their guidance are not doing something illegal, using PEDs in this case. So shouldn't, shouldn't, if we're really going to try to get to a place in boxing, oh my God, without a national commission, I don't know how we do. But if we're going to try, shouldn't everybody involved in this be held accountable? And by being held accountable, be penalized? hundred percent. What about subject? how about the poor kid who was going to fight him? Heavyweight fighters get paid. For those who don't know, get paid a lot of money. The kid who was going to fight him. Now, I think that they're talking about to come. Uh, Carlos to might step up and take that fight, which I hope he does for the uh, Jerry Forrest's sake. But, you know, you're getting ready for a camp and you're supposed to fight in a couple weeks. And the kid like, again, self-sabotages because that's what it's got to be. I mean, you know, you're going to get tested. You've already been caught twice. Everyone is sus suspect of your behavior. And he does it again. It's just um, a terrible look for boxing. And, you know, the fact that Top Rank signed him with those pre previous convictions and the way he went about it, like with a, with, a, with a title shot on the line for all the belts against AJ. I mean, shame on them for getting in bed with a guy that has these kind of these multiple convictions for doping. And again, like we talked about the first time, he wasn't just doing one thing. There wasn't like a gray area, like, well, maybe I got some tainted meat like some other fighters. No, he was caught with every drug in the world in his system. It was there was no like, mm, maybe, no. He was like basically caught in the bank with a gun, robbing it. N no, no, indefensible. With, and, the, with, the, with the dive from the explosive pack and all over the state. <laughs> well... Hopefully we won't have to talk go about like this. Go like this. Ken, go like this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry. I, I, but really, there's no room for this. Nope. I'm sorry. No. Nope. I mean, listen, I, why am I so adamant about this and you? Well, take a look. Last time you looked. We, we have, sometimes we have bad situations in our sport guys get hurt yep in a normal setting in a fair setting we just talked about one with adonis stevenson it's a tough sport it's a it's a dangerous sport so and everyone understands the risk and it's a beautiful sport when it's done right to see people challenge themselves in those kind of ways but it's it's a tough hey football's a tough sport race car driving is a tough sport but i'm just we're talking about boxing and there's inherent risk. But that's not increase them. You know, there's a risk when you're up to bat looking to hit a baseball that's coming at you 100 miles an hour. But, you know, now you let that pitcher put stuff in his veins where he can throw 110 miles an hour. I'm just using an arbitrary, you know, situation number. But... <laughs> It's, it's increased. And again, baseball has been guilty of it, but they're not hitting you over the head with the bat. <laughs> I know you could get hit with the ball. I just made a point. But that's not, that's not what you're trying to do. In boxing, you're trying to hit the guy with these. And now you inject that element into it where you can put – PEDs, steroids, whatever, into the veins of that person throwing these, hitting the person here. Well, you could argue you got criminal activity now, right? Yep. Really? You could, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, they wanted to have Senate. They had Senate hearings about the uh, with Mark McGuire and some of the other PED abusers in baseball, and it was like a national travesty. Meanwhile, in boxing, you've got guys punching the punching each other in the face with uh, juiced up on steroids, where there could actually be, to your point, some real like real physical damage. Hitting a baseball over the fence. You can't like, do that. You can't allow it. Nope. Why do they care about baseball? Not not my sport. Our sport. Why? Maybe that's a question someday that's a little uncomfortable. Why? Why? But having said that, um, you can't have it. You can't have it. It's tough enough business without it. You, you, we have to look out for these fighters every way we can. And that is one way that should not be debatable it, it should be automatic that it just can't be present and the problem is and i'll leave it to you here ken we know that it's a larger problem than this is the tip of the iceberg but because we know that there's more guys doing it and the fighters know there's more guys doing it and the fighters shouldn't the clean guys out there should not have to deal with that and worry about that, have that in their mind. They should. The problem here is uh, one of the big problems that I'm seeing now is the UFC, in my opinion, is like pulling away from boxing. They're, they're leaning into this pandemic. And, and look, I know that there's a million variables here, but for all intents and purposes, there were two events on last night, UFC and boxing, and we'll get into both of them. But I mean, one was an unbelievable spectacle and the other one was a sideshow. You also have... With top rank, you know, this isn't breaking news, but Daniel Kinahan, this alleged narco-terrorist guy from Ireland, I don't know much about him. I don't want to be on his bad side from all the stories I've read, so I want to be careful how I say this. But clearly, it raised enough eyebrows that top rank and ESPN, i.e. Disney, distance themselves from this guy within the couple of weeks that the, that the real, some real... Um, journalists started looking into the connections here with uh, Tyson Fury putting out a social media post thanking this guy who again is I mean I don't even think he can come into the United States and and I don't profess to know much about him but he's clearly involved in some shady business lives in the UAE he was involved in the deal with Tyson Fury and um, uh, Anthony Joshua in a potential matchup in 2021 but just the fact that ESPN and Disney are somehow tied to this guy who's being called in some press in some press releases a narco terrorist who's not allowed in the U.S. is crazy. I just think that it, it, all the buzz around boxing right now is incredibly negative, and everything around the UFC is positive. I mean, those fights from the UFC. I was just telling Rob, I don't care if they ever bring fans back. I hope the fighters make more money. And and look, the UFC is not without their detractors right fighters like john jones and they're mad about the money that they're making but at the end of the day they put on competitive fights every fight can go either way for the most part in boxing we're making fights that like there is no chance that the b-side guy can even like stand up for 12 rounds against the a-side so i know i don't want to like um i don't want to go too far down this road given all the the connections here but it's just a, uh, an interesting, interesting time. And with that said, before we get into the boxing from last night, I wanted to get your thoughts on the um, UFC. Because to me, it was one of the the main event was literally one of the best MMA fights I've ever seen. Dustin Poirier and Dan Hooker from Australia. But before we get into it, there was an interesting card on the uh, first fight of the main card was um, Woodson. And uh, Erosa, Woodson came in, was a minus 500 favorite. I think he was um, 7-0 and 0, uh, as, a, as an MMA fighter against a guy who was like 24-9 and 9, uh, in Erosa. Erosa was 0-3 since, get, since signing with the UFC. He signed via their Contender Series. And basically, he was fighting for his career. I mean, 0-4, you're pretty much done in the UFC. The other guy is like has all the hype. They're clearly on this guy. But A-side, B-side, classic fight. And what do you know? B-side chokes him out in the third in the third round. Just to give you an idea how big these lines were, the favorite was minus... Woodson was minus 500. Arosa was plus 350. I know you got a chance to see that one. What are your thoughts? I think you're doing a great job. 
And I think you bring up a tremendous point, a valid point, a point that I think here's the most important part of what I can say. It was a big upset, and it's not unusual in the UFC. I think that's the greatness of the UFC. It's not unusual. In boxing, especially what's going on right now in boxing, it's beyond unusual. It's impossible. It's, it's like uh, walking to the top of Mount Everest without an oxygen tank and without um, cleats, you know? <laughs> without <laughs> that a would jacket. be hard to do. <laughs> yeah. And no jacket, all right? And uh, a tank top. I mean, it's, it doesn't happen in the boxing that we're seeing now. It doesn't happen. It happens in the UFC. That, to your point, is why the UFC, it hurts me a little bit to say it, but we speak the truth here. They've moved ahead of boxing. And they're pulling ahead. They look like secretary going down the stretch. It's, it's six lanes, seven lanes, eight, nine. <laughs> it's becoming more and more. That great horse in the last race of its career, I think, in the Belmont, or one of its last races, how many lengths did it win by? <laughs> I know Rob will find it. 24! <laughs> something like that! It's not even a race anymore. And, again, to the point, last night, a great example of that. You said it beautifully, Ken. You got Woodson 7 and 0. You got this kid 0 and 3 in the UFC, 23 and 8 MMA. But they're all solid, these guys. And they know how to match them. And they match solid guys. And they're not afraid of a 7 and 0 guy losing. They definitely don't play favorites in the UFC. That guy, I mean. Some look. of the people in boxing are afraid of their stars losing. I'll go further, okay? Some of them use. They use their situation with the network that they're with to use it as a breeding grounds to build their fighters up, not to give the fans competitive fights and the network, their partner, competitive fights. They use it, they use it as a farm system to build up their stars to where they get to pay-per-view fights to keep them undefeated at, at the pleasure of themselves and at the displeasure and at the, at the, you know, ruination of the network and the fans at the, to where the, the fans are seeing a product that is, does not resemble what they're used to seeing in boxing. Two men on fairly competitive levels, fairly even terms, fairly at least, at least, where they get in there and they find out who the best man is. It's the closest thing sometimes. You ready? Get ready, Ken. Get, get ready because we're about to people look at the <laughs> sanctioners. Uh, get ready. Get ready. It's the closest thing to a fixed fight. I, I said, <laughs> yeah, there's nobody handing an envelope of cash. I'll make that very clear. Nobody doing that, saying it's not your night, like on a, on a waterfront, you know, uh, with, with uh, Marlon Brando. Yeah, the great late Marlon Brando. There's nobody saying it ain't your night tonight. Charlie, I could have been a tenter. Charlie, I could have been a contender, Charlie. But they came in and told me it wasn't my night. I, but it could have been my night, Charlie. <laughs> it could have been my night, Charlie. No, that's not going on. But the other guy can't win. He can't win. It's not because someone's paid to handcuff him, to tell him to go in the tank, as they used to say, you know, and, and take a dive. It's not that. But it might as well be in its own way the closest thing to a fixed fight because only one guy can win because the talent level is, is purposely positioned where only that 
guy can win. They know who they're putting him in with. I mean, it'd be like saying, okay, we're going to have a gun battle. All right, that's okay. All right, which side do you want? I think I'll take the side of the guy that's actually got bullets in his gun. <laughs> <laughs> Ken! I'm, I, I, I'm not taking the side of the guy that when he does this and flips open the, you know, to look, there's no bullets. <laughs> and he don't know it. I'm not taking him. Yeah. Uh, so the, there's one guy getting in the ring. And he's shooting blanks. The other guy's, you know, he, he's got a nine millimeter. Uh, you know, and, and there's no way that other than what's going to happen is going to happen. Yeah. To your point, not only have the fights been so one-sided, and I don't have the names in front of me, but in the last two broadcasts on ESPN this week, they pointed out that on on one of the favorites on the co-main, I think on Thursday night, that someone at the book in Vegas bet, I, I'm, I, the numbers are kind of like this, like 180000 to make 14000 There's been two or three bets like that on boxing in the last few shows on ESPN where you're like, that's no one makes that kind of bet unless, like you said, one guy has a gun with bullets and they know that the other guy doesn't have a chance. He's got no bullets, blanks, no bullets, you know. And Las Vegas better get on that because that I'm not that I'm concerned about our buddies in Vegas, they'll figure it out. <laughs> I think they'll be okay <laughs> because the next time you go up there, they're gonna say, Uh, oh, there's no betting on that, no, yeah, there's. There's no line on that. There's no line. You're going to see a lot of no lines. Yeah. You're going to see a lot of no action. No action on some of these fights. <laughs> Getting back to the UFC. What a terrific display that, that early fight Woodson and Arosa was. You know, Woodson being a big favorite, as you just pointed out, and Arosa. When it started, I was... I was watching a fight and I was making notes because I care about doing what we do at the best level we can do it. And I care about trying to give the fans, I don't know, what I think they, they deserve to get. And Woodson, he wins the first round. He's very flashy. He's very awkward. He switches from lefty to righty. He's very long, very tall and long, much longer than Arosa. So he's got that advantage. If he knows how to fight tall, like I used to say when I was doing the commentating on ESPN at ringside, and not everybody knows how to fight tall. But he's he's long, he's tall, he's awkward, very unorthodox. He reminded me a little bit of Prince Ahmed, who was a world champion some years ago, featherweight champ uh, from London, uh, Southport. Very awkward, very oh, good. He was, he was fun to watch. Oh, God, he was. He was. He was an awkward. He wasn't fun to watch if you were in the other corner. Definitely not. Then, then, <laughs> then you were like, I got to look at this. You know, what the heck's he doing? <laughs> but that's what Woodson was bringing. And he, and he got your attention. And it got everyone's attention. And that's why he was one of the reasons why he's the favorite. And it caught people's attention. The flash, the, all those things I just described. And you can see it. It's right there for you to see. It's very, you know, illustrative. Uh, it's like neon. You know, it lights up. And you see he wins the first round. And you again, you see why. I made a note for myself right there. I made it right here, right here. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> I made a note. I said, what I don't think anybody is noticing it's the quietness of Arosa, the quiet ability of Arosa to simply be steady. What happened in life where we don't recognize those things? Being dependable. Don't you want a friend to be dependable? Don't you want a child to be dependable? But we look at the flash, we look at all the other stuff, but we don't look at that. It's not neon. It doesn't lie, though. I was looking at it. I made a note. I said, this is going to be interesting. Yeah, Woodson won the first round. But Arosa, I see the talent that is harder to see. 
just a steady deliberateness being solid. That's the greatest compliment you could give. Cut some out of my mentor used to say in the old days, when you said a fighter was solid, you couldn't give him a better, a better compliment. It was like giving him a medal, <laughs> pinning a medal on. He's solid. You could depend on him with anybody. And what is solid? It sounds so casual, so it sounds so, you know, pedestrian, so so vanilla, like, yeah, solid. I, I want to see a guy that's fresh. I want to see a guy that's sizzling. I want to see a guy that's fat. I want to see a guy that's powerful. I want, it doesn't sound like something so significant. Oh my God, it's so significant. And I was watching it. I was watching it right in front of me. I was wishing I could sit in with those guys who do a great job, you know, the comment and, and just say, hey, hey, Look at how solid this guy is. Yeah. And and with solid, other things come. Smart, solid. It it, it 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 represents more than just being steady and calm. That's all of it, part of it. And undeterred and unbothered by getting hit a good shot. You act like a pro. But there's also smarts, like punching at the right time. The other guy, he he would. He might not have punched as much with this faster guy, but he punched at the right time. Timing can beat speed. And, you know, so the other guy, pop, pop, he just drew at the right time. And I'm watching him do this. And I'm saying, gee, he's going to get to this guy. Even though the guy won, you know, like it looked like he's going to have an easy night. He's going to get to him. He's going to. Those qualities are going to beat out the other qualities that we embrace, that we recognize so quickly, that we celebrate sometimes too quickly in life. You know, uh, we, we, celebrate a, we celebrate one of our kids, you know, being maybe outsmarting somebody, sometimes even cheating a little bit. Like, he was smart. You see how, right? right? I mean, yeah. we do a little bit of that. You know, hey, you see how smart that was? You see how smart? <laughs> and, and we don't realize because we're so enthusiastic about having an edge, having having an edge at that moment, at that moment. But what about having an edge down the road by developing characteristics that will give you an edge down the road to be dependable, to be reliable, to be there when the dust clears? The smoke settles. And he was, I just want to look at my notes here. That I said, that I'm reading what I wrote. I, I had said after the second round that he's getting to him, he's breaking them down, he's wearing them down, mentally and physically. And I could, I could see it. I, I, I could just see it happening and feel it happening. And sure enough, sure enough, that's what he did. And then he stopped him. I think he choked him out, right? In the third. Yeah, halfway through, he caught him with a Dars choke halfway through the third round. And I made a note to me myself. Arosa caught my attention early by being solid, not flashy, but effective. Even as he lost the first round, he was starting to form the environment to win. He was losing the battle early, but doing things towards winning the war, having the plan, physical plan and mindset to use pressure to break down the other guy's abilities, the abilities that we saw, that we admire, to break through them the same way that pressure breaks through pipes. It takes time, it takes physical and mental endurance to get those results. I admired this guy and I made a point to us before we started this. We were gonna go mostly into the Poria fight which might be fight of the year, unbelievable, unbelievable. But I thought this was worth mentioning for those reasons. Yeah. 
And you got a lot of those guys in the UFC. Definitely. A lot of them that have records like 23 and 8 or whatever amount of – where where in boxing, a lot of times you say, oh, you know, that, that guy gets put, put in the junk heap. Oh, my God, he's got eight losses. But how about maybe the guy became a better fighter during those eight losses instead of being protected by being put in there with popcorns all the time? where he learned how to fight, where he learned how to behave. And he became this fighter. You don't put him on a junkie. You say, hey, he went through the fire. He forged the steel that had to be forged to yield that sword later on and to win. My hat's off to the UFC. My hat's off to these fighters. I just want to tell you guys that and um, how much I appreciate the things that I hopefully just uh, brought out properly to to everybody. I hope I brought it out properly. Yeah, congratulations to Julian Arosa, who probably gets to stay with the UFC. Like I said, he was 0-3 in the UFC since signing with them. Big win for him. Big upset for Woods and hope he gets back on track. But to your point... I mean, in the main event, which we're going to talk about right now, as an example of the records, Dustin Poirier comes in 26 and 6. Hooker comes in 20 and 9. Both of these guys that ranked Dustin's number three, uh, Hooker's number five in the division, both are killers, could probably beat anyone in the top five on any given night. And like you said, probably the fight of the year, possibly the best MMA fight I've ever seen. It was, it had everything kicks. Uh, the stand-up battle was unbelievable. There was some ground fighting. And it, it was just unbelievable tactical battle. Dustin probably lost the first two rounds. I'd say he won the, the third and fourth, and it came down to the fifth round. Even halfway through the fifth, I'd say this is a toss-up. And then Dustin eventually pulled it out and, and, and overwhelmed him at the second half of that fifth round. But just talk about two gentlemen. They were, they were polite but clearly like wanted to beat the crap out of each other. It was just all business. And I was, I'm dying to hear your take on this because one of the things I wanted to point out before I turn over to you is that Dustin is the as Southpaw, and I noticed that he kept hitting Hooker with a straight left, like right down the middle, but almost where Dustin would step forward with his left foot and just lean all his weight into the left. And it was like Hooker had no answer for that. It was coming right down the middle. Dustin was standing right in front of him and just kept hitting him with straight lefts. And that would set up some more offense for Dustin. But both guys took a beating. I talked to Dustin briefly after the fight via text. He sent me a picture. He, both guys were a mess. Both went to the hospital. Unbelievable. What did you see in that one, and what are your thoughts? First of all, you say a lot when you say fight of the year, which I, I agree. You don't need me to tell you that. All you need to do is watch the darn thing. But there's been a lot of great fights in the UFC in the recent, since they've come back. Yep. Which is a great statement, again, to their, the way they go about their sport, the way that they, uh, the way they put it forward, the way they promote it, the way they organize it. So, you know, from, from the head guy, Dana White, all the way down to the acceptance and mentality of all the fighters to be in tough fights. To understand this is what we do, baby. <laughs> this is what we do. We don't go in uh we don't go in these uh easy layups give me you know fights. We we uh we go in tough fights and um we show what we are and we wanna show what we are. We don't wanna be in a fight where you know the it's all about shadows and not substance but we want to be tested we want to show we worked our whole lives to get to this place to get to a warrior status a warrior mentality gladiators we want to we want to go out there and use it we want to go out there and display it we want to go out there and inspire people 
to know that you can be like us. You can be greater. You can push the limits. You can discover things that you never knew were there to be discovered about yourself. And that's what that's what the the realm of what they do is about. Then all of them are Captain Kirk in their own starship <laughs> enterprise. Going to new places. Yep. Every time they go in there, they're ready to go to a new place. A new place. A new universe. They thought they had gone that far last time, they're ready to go even further. They're ready again to show people in their own little forum, in their own stage, in their own medium, to show people what it is to live. That exists. Live! <laughs> Go out there and find out what is really available to you. What are the boundaries? Who makes the boundaries? Who says this is where you have to stop? Who said that? Who? I didn't say it. I'm getting addicted. I have to be honest. I'm getting addicted to the sport. <laughs> well, I always want to be honest here. Yeah. I was never an MMA guy. I'm not saying I am now. You have to what, you know. I'm just saying, I'm admiring and appreciating them more and more. Yep. More and more. Because of the subtleties, too, that I talk about. Poirier, not only a good striker, he showed his dimension of getting on the floor when it was time to get on the floor and to mix it up and be able to show the grappling and the, those those places of his development where he was diversified. He was, you know, he was, he, he was so able to go into so many different things. He was more versatile in, in some ways. And what a tough guy, what a tremendous guy he had in front of him. He wouldn't have had to go to that place if he didn't have this guy in front of him. You know, because sometimes, a lot of times you didn't know that Tyson was missing something because his physical abilities, Ken, was so great that he never got taken and challenged to those places. But the way they matched them and the way these beasts, in a good way, these beasts, these UFC savages, <laughs> in a good way, like my son says when he when he has a great football player that he's scouting. Dad, the guy's a savage. <laughs> I love the guy, Dad. The guy's a savage. And to see these guys, they know that they always have to be ready to go to that place. Always. Because they're going to be put in those kind of challenges where the talent... Is that comparable mentally and physically? The challenge is always there for them. And, you know, they, like I said, to, to see guys that know that you got to bring it all. Like I was saying real quickly about Tyson, there were times when his physical ability just didn't allow. It was so much superior to the guy he was in there with where you never got to see what was underneath or what wasn't underneath. Maybe is even more appropriate yeah. to say. Yep. Until you finally did. Until you finally did. You never knew what was in there. These guys don't get a chance to get Sundays off in those areas. They don't get a, they, they got to be prepared to show what's there all the time. And for me, 
Poirier loses the first, Dustin loses the first round. The second round, he's winning. And then Hooker comes on tremendously. The last 10 tremendously. The last 10 seconds of that round two, he hit him with about 10 or 12 punches, power punches, and then kneed him in the head, and the the bell sounded, and Dustin just kind of shook his head like, whew. All right, let's go and regroup. And now again, in all fairness, we tell we we put it out there good and bad. Because hopefully that's what people they're watching us, so I'm I'm gonna guess they appreciate it. <laughs> and um and expect it. So the one area where you made a great point, thus the South Pole, good striker, right up there with the best of them. Always set, pretty balanced, solid. Solid shots, doesn't waste a lot. Um, kind of like the Chavez. The Chavez was a, one of the great fighters of all time. The fathers, Julio Cesar Chavez, a great fighter. And one of his great things was the mentality. The, he had a great chin, deliberate, steady, dependable, good body puncher, technically solid. Not not to say, not, not like, you know, real slipster like a Whitaker. Or like a like a, obviously a Mayweather, but just a solid hands up, solid technically, didn't do too many things wrong, and you had to beat him. That's how guys like Poirier are. You gotta beat him. You ain't getting no free ride. And Chavez would always he he didn't waste a lot. You know everything was meaningful. And Poirier kind of along those lines where everything's for a purpose. He's not wasting a lot. And, but again, where we give him credit, this is where I give him criticism, where he can get better. And, and most of the UFC guys, where the ones that are really good strikers, which catches our attention, we like it. I mean, that, that, that I appreciate more and more all the dimensions, as I just pointed out. And that's one of the reasons why Poirier won. He was so dimensional. But we catch, we, we like to see what is similar to our sport and what I'm comfortable with and familiar with, the striking. And the one thing, and when I say criticism, I mean in a constructive way. I don't mean because you can't criticize these guys truly. But I'm just saying where well, you can get better in a technical way is and where they come up a little short is even with the best ones with their striking from an offensive situation their defense has a lot to a lot to improve as their defense can get better they 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 a lot of them don't have haven't learned how to mix defense and offense where it's offense and it's the mentality you know, and as uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get to where we want to get to, and things like punches, they're not gonna stop us. You know, <laughs> that's a good point. But but where a boxer would have more the mentality to avoid the punch, to the teaching, the teaching too, to avoid the punch, and you know, you should have the attitude. Customato used to say, Teddy. We want to make our guys where they have the attitude that a punch is like a raindrop hitting a windshield. That's that's the impact it has. It splatters off. No impact. It's like raindrops hitting a windshield. Bah, 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 and they slide off. But in reality, we want that attitude if they hit you. But we want to have the windshield wiper so they don't. <laughs> They don't get to the windshield. Yeah, yeah. We want to, and, and it's, at first you say, what do you mean? No, you want the attitude that if they hit you, they have the effect of a raindrop hitting the windshield. But you don't want them hitting the windshield. You want that windshield wiper. If they hit it, they hit it. And that's where Poirier and most of these guys, maybe all of them, can get better, where they can introduce the component of the defense. And the mentality, without giving up any of the mentality they have, because they put so much into that mentality of eating 
you know, splattering it off like a windshield, eating that punch so much into that mentality that I just think it's a matter of there hasn't been any effort given to the thinking of the technique and the teaching of that you could also avoid them a little more. How about this? Would and, you ever would you ever consider working with a UFC fighter on that on a stand up aspect of their game? Years ago, I was asked to by one of them. Uh, real, I was going to say a real tough guy, but but that's that's like saying uh, you know that's like saying a, a a pizza with cheese on it. Yeah, I mean you're not faking your way through it in the UFC. I mean, like that's you're not slipping that's, through the cracks. Yeah, I mean, really, that's like. You know, saying a a football that has strings on it. Oh, really? Yeah. All right. I mean, that's that's what they are. They're all tough. But I, I at that time, I I didn't do it. But um, but what I did do was I met with one of the guys one time. They had found out that I was going to be in California with uh, my son around the holidays because my son works for the Oakland Raiders. And they asked me if I would meet with them and, you know, talk about the possibilities of it. And I, what I did was I spent one day in the gym with one of them. It was, it was good. It was good. To, to, and, and the funny thing was, what did I work on that day, that one day? What we're talking about? You know, because they already got the striking down. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there's certain parts of the striking that can be enhanced. Like sometimes you might throw too many from the middle. You got to know how many to throw, you know, what position to throw them from, where not to throw a punch. You know, sometimes you have to, and that's the thing that I think they, that they battle with is they're so invested into the mentality of, of the strike and, and the mental force that's with it. Almost like, like, Remember that cartoon of Fantastic Four where one of them had a, a shield that could go out? One yep. of their powers was the shield to protect you. The force field? Yeah. <laughs> their force field, they have a force field that they think that they can just, they don't have to worry about this. They're, they're not, almost like it takes away, almost like making a concession to do that would take away from the mentality of being prepared the way they're prepared yeah to do a war yeah, does, yeah. does that make sense to yeah, you yeah yeah almost like they refuse to avoid the punishment because they think that they're going to give out more punishment than they'll take I, I don't think they're purposely doing it i just think that the emphasis the emphasis the teaching the mentality the code as such that it begins there. It begins there. Nobody breaks us. Punches do not disturb us. Punches become, you know, like the great, when you listen to one of these in a movie you, or a documentary, like a Bruce Lee documentary, you listen to some of the great Japanese or Chinese martial artists that, that say the punch it has no power over you. And then first you hear that. What the hell does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> what do you mean the punch has no power? But that's what I'm talking The punch has no power over you. And that, so their mentality is so focused on that, that there's no teaching and no philosophy because they don't want to take away from the significance, the weight, the weight of that, the greatness of that, the worth of that, the importance of that. And I'm just saying that you can without cheating that, without cheating that. And perfect case in point, in the second round, when I thought Poirier was winning, what a fight. I thought he was winning. And then all of a sudden, to your point, towards the end, all of a sudden, he gets caught with a barrage of punches. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. But why did he get caught? See, we don't even, in UFC, we don't talk. We just say, 
Wow, ho, ho, ho. Whoa, look at that. Wow, we're just, <laughs> we, we are so, we marvel in their greatness in those areas yep. of being able to overcome. To That's a good point. Things that most point. We don't even think of, oh, wait a minute, why did you get hit with that? I think of it. I can't help it. So he got hit because he did what I used to say all the time on ESPN when corner fights. He took a picture after his last punch. Yeah. He posed. He waited for the receipt. <laughs> Custom auto used to drive my head. Don't wait for the receipt. <laughs> you pay? Get out of the store. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Don't wait for the receipt. We don't want receipts. And Dustin, the great Dustin, because all these guys, I, I mean, I, I don't, you, you can't knock them. You're, you're just trying to explain something to enhance to, in some area. After his punch, whatever that combination was, bang, bang, whatever it was, I don't remember, he posed. He waited for the receipt. Bang, bang, bang. The guy caught him. Now, if simply he had been tossed to move his head. Pop, pop, move his head. Move his head after that last punch. To ingrain that. He would have avoided that and probably would have won the second round. Yeah, no, I agree. Those are areas, you know, I mean, that's one of them. I mean, obviously, there's other, you know, there's other areas too. Um, you know, some of them, even in the first fight, uh, the fight I was talking about, I was so impressed with the steadiness of Barossa. Yeah. Woodson being a taller guy would throw his long, taller, longer arm too late. He didn't get full extension. He only got it about this far, Ken. Yeah. That's not, that's not long. You're not the longer guy now. And he thrown it from too short, too close. Bang, he got hit with right hands. That's why, because he didn't understand that. You know, so having said that, that's that's one area that if they, with everything else they got, if they can improve in those areas, man, you you might, I mean, you might have a Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> Of all, of, of all the guys I've known in the UFC, to me, and knowing your personality, having been in camp with you and, and knowing the way you do things, if there's one guy who I think would be the perfect match for you to work with, it would be Dustin Poirier. I think you guys would get along like a house on fire, and I think he would improve dramatically by spending some time with you and not but I'm not doing this for that reason. No, Ken. I know you're not. I, want, I know you're not. I don't want the sig I don't want the message or the thought of a message to be that in any way I'm not gonna people with them. I think they're doing a great job. I'm no, explaining no, no. I agree. from my perspective. And that wasn't my point I at all. I think they're doing a tremendous job. No, I'm with you. And I wasn't advocating for you to be his trainer. I just think that I know the level of respect. He mentioned some of your quotes after the fight. He mentioned in the post-fight interview that the fight's not a fight until there's something to overcome. I just know he has a lot of admiration and will probably benefit from some of your knowledge. But I'm with, I know you're not advocating for that position. And he does have a great team with uh, the guys in South Florida. I think it's uh, Mike Brown and the guys that I think American top team. But, um, man, but Ken, what, yeah. he was down. He, he, no, go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. No, no, that was all I had to say. Yeah, he was down two rounds going into the third. He was down two nothing. And he's going into the third. And he had to go to another place, Ken. I think this might be missed a little bit on how it's hard to really quantify this properly, given enough. Respect. It really is. What a tough guy he had. What a good guy he had in front of him. Really. He's with the guy. That's how good he is. That's yeah. how good or good. He's with. He's taller. He's longer. So Purry has got to deal with those physical dimensions, right? He's got to deal with that. So he gets inside. He mixes it up. He gets him on the floor in the third round. He starts mixing it up to even the playing field. Take away some of those physical attributes of Hooker. He's got to deal with all those things. And he's got to entice somehow Hooker to give those things up or not to use them the right way. How do you do that? You can't ask the guy. <laughs> 
you can ask. I don't think he'll listen. <laughs> well, I don't think he's going to give you the answer you want. <laughs> so how do you do that? You go to a place where you start controlling the biorhythms of the fight. People don't even know it. The frequencies of the fight, there's frequencies in the air. There are. There's frequency. I mean, we're sitting here, and there's all kinds of stuff with all the internet, with all the advanced technology. That's, there's, there's stuff flying all over the place we're not even aware of. All over the place, flying around in the air. Who's sending it? Who's transmitting it? It's being transmitted from somewhere. What are you transmitting? You're a transmitter. If you want to be, if you want to be, you transmit things, feelings, thoughts. And by transmitting those things, you have reaction. Impact. He started to, he understood. But how do you do that unless you understand it has to be done? Awareness. Awareness. And, and there's a difference here. I don't mean just a guy that goes to another place and just comes out, just comes out, you know. <laughs> Some people think that's what it is. Yeah. When they talk about digging deep. Yep. We use that cliche, right? Dig deep. What is digging deep? What is it? What I just showed you, you know what that is? Kamikaze. Yes. Getting it over with. Getting it over with. Submitting. Submitting without leaving fingerprints. Yeah. Submitting without leaving fingerprints. No DNA left behind that tie you to the crime of submitting because you went all out. Ah! Oh, you gave in. You hoped that would get you off the hook. Either you get lucky, you get it over with. Dustin, these guys are these guys are the real deal, and the real deal is aware. I must stay calm. I must be able to think and know what and how I have to change something here to change the results in three rounds. To keep, get him from using his height, to get him not to to get him to be more adaptable to what I need, more pliable to what I need. And like we said, joking around, you can't ask him. <laughs> Do you transmit your will? You become the ocean. Yeah. You become the ocean and you make him the log. That's what this special guy, and there's a bunch of them out there in that sport, Poirier did. He became the ocean. Calm, sir, I'm going to be the ocean. I'm not going to, ah! no, 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 no. I'm going to be the ocean, the steady ocean. And um, my plan is to make him the lob. To make him come in when he would be better off staying out. Mm -hmm. To make him stay in a little longer when he would be better off drifting away. <laughs> and that takes understanding of the domain the domain we're talking about, of what you control, what you can control, 
what 99% of people, I, I was going to say 90%, but I'd be so far off. 98, 99% of people, they don't understand that you can control that. You must control that. If you're going to fight on this level and turn things around in those kind of situations. Michael Jordan understood it. I know he wasn't in a combat sport, but every combat is has its different initiatives. It's, it's got its, its different weapons, <laughs> but it's but it's it's combat in different forms. What Michael Jordan did was every bit combative, every bit, you know, without breaking ribs or <laughs> you know. <laughs> Messing up cartilage like I had messed up in my nose. Every bit is combative. Sending out forces, making your opponent give just so slightly, think so slightly of what they shouldn't think about. That's what that's what these guys do. Oh, it's magnificent. It's magnificent. I, I have nothing but appreciation when I see it again, because I'm not seeing just the blood and the busted up eyes. And the, I'm, I'm seeing the other, the part I'm trying and praying and hoping that I'm getting across in a way that they deserve it to be gotten across. It was, it's really, spectacular to watch it really is to see it to see a man take his place of where he's going and turn it into a destiny of where he wants to go he has to go It's, it's, you know, I tell fighters, when you get to this place in a fight, and it's going to come, part of it is you got to remember what you wanted to be. What do you mean, Ted? You got to remember, because what that pressure of those moments, the blood in your eye, the pain in your chest, the wheezing in your breath, the numbness in your muscles. When that moment comes and starts taking, trying to take you over, you must remember where you wanted to be, what you wanted to be how you want to feel, what you want to feel tomorrow. Tomorrow, who do you want to be tomorrow? Who do you want to be tomorrow? Who, who? When, when, you're, when you're doing it and you know, you're so sure of what you want to be and what you want to feel and what you want to represent, you're so sure of it. You're so sure of it. And that stuff comes. It makes you unsure of it. It makes you unsure of it. It makes everything a jigsaw puzzle. It makes you like a kaleidoscope. Everything gets distorted. And it makes you forget what you wanted. Almost think that it doesn't matter. You have to remember how much it mattered on that day when you knew, when you were sober, clean, free of all that pressure, when you knew what it meant, when you knew what it mattered to your family, to yourself, to whatever, that you knew what it meant, you knew clearly, this is what it means. You must be able to go there and see that and hold that at that moment and see it just as clearly. This is what it means. 
This is how much it matters. He was able to go to that place. Dustin in the third round was able to go to that place. And don't think there's not a flicker in that in that flame sometimes, in that cable. When you get, you know, sometimes you got a connection and, and the cable, it's been around a long time, that cable. And all of a sudden, it's got a little bend in it. Oh, hello. And you lose it. You lose it. But then you move it and, oh, I hear you. I hear you. You're coming through again. You're transmitting again. Yeah, there can be a little flick there. Well, for a split second, you, you've split second, you might almost have forgotten. You must be able to, th those guys, they, they instantly remember. No, this is when, when I was clear, this is, this is what I wanted to be. This is how I wanted to feel. This is what I, I know tomorrow how, where I, what I want to be able to say and feel how I want to be able to walk, simply walk, simply walk anywhere I want to. And you have to remember the memory gets distorted in life in pressure. In those situations, the memory, the memory gets distorted. It, it, it's what comes, it's the dangerous component of depression. It's the part that hurts you, that can kill you. There's always a part that can kill you. That's the part that can kill you. It makes you forget. It makes you think it's okay to forget. And they, and those guys have no safety net. There's no safety net. There's no amount of money. You know, some people have that safety net. I got millions of dollars in it. That's just enough to let go. No, they have no safety net. They have no safety net. They might have 10 million in the bank. In their mind, it's still this. <laughs> Zero. Because the only bank that counts is this bank. This bank. This bank. And they're open every freaking day. <laughs> they ain't closed on Sundays. Yep. And we don't allow withdrawals on days that we fight. No withdrawals. That's it. I'm well, done. <laughs> well, I know Dustin's going to enjoy that. I was going to have him jump on this Zoom call with us, but he's actually on a flight back to Louisiana uh, right now. And uh, but maybe we'll see if we can't get to a do what to do what to do what now I'm to do what to wrestle an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> what you, well, Dustin, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do? You're going to you're, you're going to just to get rid of the aches because, you know, you got to do a little exercise with, to get rid of the aches. You can just wrestle around maybe with an alligator. <laughs> or he's, two. he's probably going back now to go back to work tomorrow morning at the Good Fight, the Good Fight Foundation, his uh, Good Foundation. nonprofit, his charity that him and his wife run down in Louisiana. They're doing a lot of good. Please check them out. The Good Fight uh, foundation. I think it's the good fight foundation.com, but check it out. Rob will double check right now. But, uh, once again, congratulations to Dustin. Incredible, incredible victory. Couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Such a good guy. And, uh, maybe sometime, maybe at some point in the coming week or two, we can get him back on here. See if we can't do a quick chat with him just about, um, the, the 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 fight this past, uh, last night and the work that he's doing with his charity. And, uh, so his um his website just for those who are interested it's the goodfightgroup.com please check it out it's definitely worth it we did some t-shirts with them last year with the proceeds going to um the good fight uh, again can't say enough good things about him uh, please check out bjjfanatics.com check out Teddy's boxing tutorial like I said I know a lot of people have asked us about different things or have asked me about different elements of boxing to relate to Teddy um 
Check that video out. You can find all the fundamentals you need there. Uh, BJJFanatics.com. Search Teddy Atlas, and I'm sure you'll find it easy enough. Hey, you know the guys who do that, Ken? Thank you. The guys that do that, the BJJ, they're the best at it. Yeah. Forget about me. But they're the best at it. They're number one in the world. I mean, that's a fact. They're number yep. one in the world at it. Yep. And, and I'm privileged that they, you know, to be able to do it with them. And being that we're talking to an MMA audience, that's what those guys are. Yep. They're, matter of fact, they're legends in, in that, in that, um, in that sport, you know, in, in that, um, you know, in, in that world, they're, they're legends. I mean, they, this is what, that's what they do. They they understand that. Matter of fact, my video is the first one that they did with boxing from what, from what they told me. So, um, and not to mention that one of them is married to one of the Gracies. You talk about royalty. <laughs> I mean, yep. in, in the MMA world. Yep. That's royalty. Yep. And once you go to the uh, BJJFanatics.com, you can search by fighter. So if you just search Teddy Atlas there, it'll bring up the video. And um, yeah, once again, congratulations to Dustin Poirier. Congratulations also to Alex Vosdick on an incredible career. Like you said, uh, Olympics bronze medalist, WBC light heavyweight, and lineal champion of the world. Guys had an incredible career. Well done, Alex. Uh, hope to see him soon in Southern California in his business endeavors. And um, one guy we hope we don't see again in the ring is Big, ba Big Baby Miller. Uh, but with that, um, you got anything else, Teddy? No, I just, I just want to um, maybe say what I started when I showed this at the beginning. Send my love out to everybody. That's all. And, yep. and just, you know, we... We can't get enough of that stuff. So just tell everyone, uh, just send it out. Be safe. Um, be smart out there with the virus still and everything. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Be safe and um, give care about other people. Care about other people. And uh, sometimes your care can make them better. That's a very good That's point. It. Well, thanks for doing this, Teddy. Thanks, for guys, for being with us. Please, uh, like I say all the time, leave a review, share the link. We appreciate all the love and support. We've got awesome fans. So thanks for being with us, and uh, we'll be back with you soon enough. Take care. Oh,